Welcome to the latest Power BI tutorial. This Power BI tutorial is for you either if you're a beginner or you have started using Power BI but having trouble figuring it all out. I'm Avi Singh, Microsoft MVP and best-selling Power BI author and in this tutorial we will take you from zero to dashboard and from rookie to pro. We're going to break it down and make it super easy for you as we take you step by step through Power BI. As we build our dashboard, we would walk you through the Power BI process to author the model, publish it online, then have you and other users consume the beautiful dashboard and reports. But our main focus would be on the authoring step, which is the most crucial step. As you continue to watch all the way to the very end of this video, you would learn how to use the query editor, the kitchen of Power BI, to connect to your data and clean up your data. You will learn about relationships and DAX measures, the heart of a Power BI model, and how to create beautiful visualizations. Here's a list of topics I'll be covering and the links are in the description below. So you can jump to a specific topic anytime you want. I would recommend watching this whole video first, then come back and follow along step by step using the download files. This tutorial is complete in itself, but at times I may mention more advanced material which you can watch next. All the links including the one to download files are in the video and in the description. This is a slightly fast paced video packed with a lot of good stuff. If you would prefer a slower paced tutorial, I would link to that as well. Or if you feel you already know this stuff, then check out my advanced videos on modeling and DAX. Now, if you get stuck anywhere in this tutorial and have any questions, you can ask me directly on my live Talk Power BI show every single Friday. Just make sure to subscribe and click that bell so you are notified whenever I go live to answer your Power BI questions. Just one tip, for the best quality playback throughout this video, change the auto quality setting. Instead, select one of the HD options. When you hear Power BI, I want you to think two things, Power BI Desktop and PowerBI.com. We're going to talk about PowerBI.com in the end, but we would start with Power BI Desktop because it's the one tool that you must master to get started and eventually become a Power BI Pro. Power BI Desktop is the authoring tool used to create Power BI models and reports. There are three phases to developing a Power BI project. The most critical step is author, and you do that using Power BI Desktop. Let's take a look. First, make sure you have Power BI Desktop installed, and for that, you just Google Power BI Desktop download and go from there. If you need more help, then we're going to link to a video which gives you more detail and tells you about the different options. So once you have Power BI Desktop and you launch it for the very first time, I remember when I did it, it was scary. I was staring at this big white screen and I wasn't quite sure what I needed to do. Well, this time I'm here to help you. So what I'm going to tell you is that Power BI, think of Power BI as a machine, as an engine. And an engine needs its fuel. And what is the fuel of Power BI? It's data. It's your business data and it loves that, right? The messier, the better. And the way to get data into Power BI is, is this section right here. So we're gonna start over here in this section and we're gonna start with the get data button which is right there. So once you click on that button, you're gonna see that it shows you a few of the common options right there. So you can see it right there, but we're gonna click more just so we can experience the awesomeness that Power BI has to offer. So for one, you can see right away that it has the ability to connect to lots and lots of different data sources. And even if the one that you, you are trying to connect to is not listed here, which is pretty rare, but still you might be able to connect to it using either ODBC or OData feeds or some generic connector like that. So pretty much doesn't matter what your data source is, you would be able to connect to that. And again, you can see a long list of sources. And again, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna see some example of that, but 
you can connect to more than one data sources and bring it all together into one single model. So you can be selecting maybe one file from your uh, SQL server and then uh, one table from your SQL server and then something coming from Excel, something coming from a SharePoint online list and on and on and on. And all of that, you can combine it into this one spot. So we're going to start with uh, our data source and we have an Excel file in this example. So I'm just going to uh, select that and click connect. Now, based on the data connector you, you choose, it's going to ask you different questions. For example, SQL is going to ask you the look in the name of the server, credentials, and so forth. For Excel, all we need to do is to point it to that specific file. And this file is part of your download, so go ahead and use that file. So I specified Power BI that, hey, this is the file to connect. And once you specify the data source, what it's doing is it's, it's examining that data source, whatever it is, Excel, SQL, Access, or something else, and it's checking what is available inside of that. And that's what it comes back and shows that to you in the navigator. Now in Excel, sometimes this can be confusing because it might return what look what would look like, hey, it's showing me the same thing twice. So notice here, this has this date, date key, and if you go here, these look similar because in Excel, it shows you the sheets, and if it finds tables, Excel tables inside, it shows them as separate as well. And you can tell that by the icon it's using and the fact that tables uh, show up as the table name. So in this case, we have these clean tables. Now, if you do have a choice like this, I would always select the table just because tables have more crisp boundaries, whereas sheets sometimes, you know how you can mess up the boundary of that. So in this case, I want you to just simply select the top tables up here. And you can see that as you click on something, it shows you a preview of that. So if your data source has lots and lots of tables, this can be a quick way to kind of just glance and check to make sure that you're getting the right thing. So we're going to select all of this and we are going to click load. Now you're seeing what it's doing right now is it's actually connecting to your data source, whatever you would supply. In this case, it's Excel, but it could be SQL. And what it did is it made a copy of that data set. So nothing changed on this screen, but let's talk about this layout. We zeroed in on this get, get data. So you might see panels here and we'll talk more about that. But already on this fields panel, uh, I didn't expand it earlier, but earlier this would have been completely blank. And now you can see these tables are being shown here. We'll collapse this for now. And then go over to the left side where we have these three panes. There's a report, data, and model or relationship view. So report is still blank and that's okay. But if you switch to the data tab, you can actually see the underlying table that it has fetched from that data source. And you can click through and kind of examine these tables and see how the data has, has come through. What I'm gonna do is save this file and then I'll check back in with you. All right, so here we have, this is the original uh, data source that I had pulled into my Power BI file and this is the Power BI that I had saved. Now you can see that the Power BI file is, is much smaller in size than our original data source, which is pretty amazing given that Excel itself, it stores the data in a compressed format. But all I wanted to show you here was that Power BI is really, really amazing at compressing data. And that's how it can not only handle millions of rows, but hundreds of millions of rows and beyond. I'm gonna show you the third view, which is the model or relationship view, which is right there. And if you click on it, you will see that you see the tables here as well. We'll come back and talk a whole lot more about relationships. So far, we have brought in a very extremely clean data. And in real life, that's rarely the case. Well, okay, that's actually never the case. Real data is always messy data. And, uh, you know, here is one example of that. Now, the odd thing about this is that you or, you know, you or me may not call it messy. What I call this is that often we would find data sets which are human friendly, but they're not machine friendly. As far as machines are concerned, this data is noisy. I mean, th these colors don't make much sense. Machines don't care about that. Uh, when I say machine, I really mean Power BI. 
Power BI doesn't care about these header rows. Again, that's been there just to assist us humans. <laughs> and and which is that we have uh, uh, this data spread out on columns. That's awkward for Power BI. Uh, it's redundant because the grand total is, is essentially repeated. It can be calculated from these monthly totals. It has subtotals and a lot of other things going on here. So again, this is human friendly, but not machine friendly. To Power BI, this is messy data. Let's see how we can clean it up and bring it into Power BI. So we're gonna go back again to our get data and click Excel from this dropdown. At this time, we're gonna select our messy file, the budget file, which again is part of your downloads as well. Now it does the same thing. It examines the file and checks what's inside. In this case, it's just one uh, sheet. So it, it's uh, we're gonna select that. But this time, we're not gonna click load because we're gonna, we're gonna enter a magical realm, my friend, the kitchen of Power BI. Are you ready for that? So when you click edit, watch what's gonna happen. It's actually gonna pop open a new window. So I'm gonna you know, make this window a little bit smaller as soon as it gives me a chance. So there you go. So you can see how the Power BI window is in the back, but now this new query editor window has been opened. And you should think of this as a component of Power BI, but an extremely powerful component of Power BI. In fact, Power BI has two engines that you need to master to become a pro. One is the query editor. It all starts here. All data goes through this. This is the kitchen of Power BI. And the other engine is the model where you need to understand relationships and DAX. We'll get to that. Stay tuned for that. So here we are in the kitchen of Power BI. And remember when I said every data comes through here? So you notice here that even when we clicked load, we did not click edit for these queries, they still are placed here, but there's not much cooking or cleaning going on for this. It's, it's simply just connected to the data source and just brought it back in. But for budget, we're gonna sharpen our knives and get at it. But before we dive in, let me orient you to what's going on here. Now, for, first of all, what do you have in a good kitchen? You have lots of gadgets and appliances, and this is chock full of that. So you, it's got lots and lots of goodies up at the top in the ribbon, a very familiar interface if you worked with Office, Excel, PowerPoint, on any of these tools. And it's gonna be so much fun just selecting our, our tools here and getting at our data and cleaning it up. So that's at the top, the ribbon. On the left side here, of course, you're seeing the queries. Now you can organize them in groups and folders as well. I'll let you explore that on your own. That's usually needed only when you have uh, lots and lots of queries. Let's say you end up with 40 and 50 tables uh, going through uh, to Power BI. On the right side here, we have the query settings pane and it has a name, which is really important because this is not just the name in the query editor, this is the name it's gonna end up with in your model as well. That's what's gonna show up. So you wanna give it a good name if it doesn't come, if it comes with a quirky name or something like that. And applied steps, the part you see over here, this is where all the magic happens. Now Power BI does try to help us out a little bit here. So let's uh, let's get started and cleaning up this data. The first thing I want you to do is go over to the applied steps and just delete this change type and promote it headers. So Power BI again was trying to help us, trying to make the best guess of what it needs to do with the data, but it didn't get it right that time, and that's okay, we'll excuse it for that. All right, so now we're gonna get it to work. Now you see the first thing I notice over here are these header rows, header rows, which are again, were, are there for humans. Machines don't need them, this is just, you know, FII, and we would rather focus on the data, which is the budget amounts. So we need to remove these rows, and again, what I talked about, the kitchen of Power BI, you have all the utensils and knives and everything available to you over here. So the, the one we're looking for here is this remove rows. So I want you to go ahead and click on that and from here select the remove top rows option. That's gonna pop up a dialog box and ask you how many rows. And in, in our case, we wanna remove the first three. So I'm just gonna type in three and hit okay. Now here's where I want you to watch really carefully because if you blink, you might miss it. So I'm gonna hit okay and watch what happens. So first thing that happened is those three rows were actually removed. So in the middle, it's showing us a preview of the data as it's working on right now. So those rows are gone, but whoa. You remember I said this is where the magic happens? Watch what happened here. It added a step here. I'll come back and talk more about this, but yeah, keep your eyes uh, you know, glued to this section, watch what, watch what it does. So remove the top rows, and now what do we need to do? Oh gosh, look at that, I mean, I, I don't want it to be called column one, column two, I have my headers right here. 
I wish there was a button which would make the first row as headers. Uh, wish granted, my friends. There it is. Use first row as headers. So go ahead and click that. You see how easy it is? It's just, you know, I love doing this. So use first row as headers. And again, you notice the change in the preview pane, but more importantly, you also see it as recorded here, so promoted headers. And again, sometimes it tries to help you and add steps on its own. You may or may not need that. We'll, we'll leave that in for now. All right, so we promoted headers. Now the next thing we need to do is notice here that there are these subtotal rows. Again, they're redundant as far as Power BI is concerned. So we don't need that. To filter these out, I want you to click on this, this triangle, this filter icon next to the column name. Once you click on that, it's going to show you a lot of options. Now, sometimes these options are actually, well, these options may depend on the type of the data field. So if it's a numeric field, you would see instead of text filters, you would see, actually, let me just show it to you really quick. So it'll say, hey, number filters, and then you can say greater than, less than, and so forth. But let's come back over here, and here we're going to say text filters does not contain the word total. Now, watch out though, because Power BI, uh, the query editor piece is case sensitive. So uh, make sure the T is capital and you type it just like that. And again, we're gonna hit OK and watch the magic happens. So again, it removed those rows, but more importantly, it added that step here. If you are an Excel user, this may seem familiar. This may feel like, oh, well, macro recording, isn't it? Well, it is, but way more awesome, my friends. For one, for me, it feels like a time machine. I can go step by step and examine exactly how things were, how my data looked like at that step. Now, what this does is it does two things. One, it makes your queries and this process of cleaning, shaping, and transforming your data self-documenting. How many times have you looked at somebody else's report and weren't able to figure out how they exactly did it? Well, how many times has that happened for your own reports where you open it after a month or even a week and say, scratch your head and say, how did I do that? I don't quite remember. Well, that is all a thing of the past because again, you can time travel and you can go step by step. It's all documented as part of you doing it. And not just that, this is way more awesome than macros because in macros, recording it and editing it is a whole different level. Editing, you gotta dive into the code and look at that and here, editing or making changes to an existing query, going back and fixing things. Let's say your business data changed and now you got uh, not three header rows, but four header rows. It's really easy to change a step. All you do is click on this gear icon and you can change the exact setting that was for that step. You can delete a step just by hitting that red, uh, red cross there. You can insert a step at any point if you want. You can just click on the button again and it's gonna say, hey, do you wanna insert a step? And go ahead and insert it. You see how easy it is in Power BI. Our job isn't done here, so let's keep going. So I'm going to skip ahead to the last step that we had, and we just have a few things left here. For one, if you scroll all the way to the side, then you're going to notice that there is the grand total uh, column here, which again is redundant. We don't need that. We can calculate the grand totals by summing up all of these values. So we're going to right click on that and say remove. You can also find the remove columns button right here on the toolbar. Now, hey, we're on to my favorite steps. Now, first of all, this data shape, why is that clumsy for Power BI? Again, it makes the table uh, very easy uh, to read for humans. Let's go back to that. So why do we humans use this format? Well, because, you know, we can easily scan across and say, oh, well, how much do we sell in vendors in May? And, and you know, we can, it helps us. But for machines, it's clumsy because imagine if you go to Power BI and ask Power BI to say, show me the total sales for the year. Well, now it's got to sum up not one, two, three, four, but 12 columns. And now imagine this data if it was spread across not just one year, but multiple years. You see how the problem just compounds itself, just gets more and more complicated. What we would rather have is instead of this data being spread out in columns, you would rather have it in rows. Now, this is something which was, I found it so hard in the old world, the, the BP era, the before Power BI, oh my gosh, I don't want to go back to that. And, and it was incredibly hard to do for me. And I did know a trick or two in SQL Unpivot and this, that, but it was never easy. I never looked forward to that. But of course, in Power BI, let me show you how easy it is. So what we're going to do is we're going to select the columns that we need to move to rows and that uh, that transformation 
by the way, it's called Unpivot. And guess what? Yes, there is a button for that. Yep, we're in the kitchen of Power BI and we have all the gadgets and instruments available to us. So we're gonna go in here and click on this Unpivot Columns button. So let me, let me do that and again, watch what happens in the table and on the Applied Steps. So I'm gonna click on that and voila, look at that. So all my data has been moved from columns to rows and of course that step has been recorded in, in the applied steps. Let's do a few more steps here. So one, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna rename this column and what I did was double click. I guess you can right click and uh, rename as well. There we go. And we're just gonna rename that to month and we're gonna rename this one to budget amount. And next I'm gonna change the data type of the month column to date. And for this, you can go up in the uh, in the ribbon here and change the data type from there. What I find myself normally doing is I would just click on this this icon next to the column name and then select the data type. So, and the one you want to select for this is date. Great. Now that that's done, we are ready to uh, move out of the query editor. And and uh, remember, this was a window that opened outside. And the way to do that is just to hit close and apply. As before, it's going to the budget table, and boy, this was a short table, so it made quick work of that. And now if you notice on the field side, you would see the new budget table, you would see it in the data view, you can examine how the data came in, so that's how a budget table looks like, and it also shows up in the relationship view, right there. Once you have all of your data sources connected like that, and again, you can connect to lots and lots of different data sources, and for each data source and data set and table that you bring in, you can apply exactly the clean shape and transform steps that you need in the query editor. But the best part is, from that point on, to refresh all of that data from multiple sources with a lot of cleanup steps, all you have to do is just click this one button, refresh, and it's gonna go connect to all the data sources, apply the steps that you just recorded, and uh, pull the data in. Now, if you get tired of clicking this button, you can also automate the data refresh in Power BI. We're gonna talk about that later. Let's talk about the next exciting concept in Power BI which is the magic of relationships. Now for this, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna delete these lines, uh, these relationships, and these lines represent the relationships which have been created by Power BI by default and rearrange the tables as well. And I'm just gonna right click and delete this. So let me do that, rearrange the tables, and I'll be right back. I am back and our tables are nice and pretty. Now when I work with my students and my clients, I place a lot of emphasis on how these tables are arranged and I always arrange them in a very specific pattern. Now this might seem silly putting so much emphasis on this, but this is important because this underlies a really important concept. Now my friends, here's a secret to really becoming good at Power BI, is you build models not reports. Most people in Power BI, all they care about is the visualization and that's their end goal. And they, they have that in mind, like, oh, I wanna build this report and it needs to show sales by year or whatever, right? Whatever report you're building on. But every Power BI report should be underpinned by a really strong, robust model. And for that, the this that's why this stuff is important. So the way I've arranged these tables is with, with the data tables at the bottom and the lookup tables at the top. Now we're gonna have link to a separate video which with more details about data and lookup tables and their differences and also about uh, Power BI modeling best practices. But for now, I'll give you a quick version. Data tables record transactions and they have lots and lots of rows and they're really tall. So sales can have, uh, well, this one is short, it's sample data, but this can have millions and millions of rows. So that is our data table, it's tall, and it's intentional that I, I've made this tall. Now, our lookup tables are the who, what, where, when, how. So if you look at sales, well, who bought it? What did they buy? The product, where did they buy? Territory, when did they buy? Calendar, and sometimes you capture additional attributes in the how. So these are the lookup tables, and they're usually not as tall, not as big. If you had 100 million sales transactions, well, hopefully you didn't sell it to 100 million different customers, or you didn't sell 100 million different products. It's just not gonna happen in a real data set. So maybe you would have a few hundred or thousand, or maybe, uh, you know, so less number of customers. So these are our data tables, and these are our lookup tables. Now, traditionally, if you are, are, are you know, are an Excel user, 
what you would do next is you would do a VLOOKUP from here to there. So you would say VLOOKUP the product key to the product table and just tell, bring in everything down and essentially flatten the table, create one big flat table. Now you don't need to do that. All you need to do is drag and drop and that's how easy it is to can create the relationship between these tables. So I'm going to expand this just a little bit so I can see. So I'm going to take product key and here I am kind of just dragging it and I'm going to drop it on the product key over here. And again, the direction doesn't matter and that creates this line which represents the relationship. And if you hover over that, it's going to highlight the columns that it, it's uh, that are connected. And I'm going to do the same with the customer key. So again, this time again, the direction doesn't matter. It automatically de de detects which one is the data, which one is a lookup table. And if you if your tables are set up correctly, well, in this data set, they are uh, uh, then w the way it would look like is it'll have this one on here and star on this side. Now, a little bit of technical speak, this is indicating a one to many relationship. What that means is that the customer key in the lookup table is unique. It only appears once. And whereas in sales, a customer key can appear multiple times because, hey, the same customer can come in and buy multiple times. And the other thing that I'm going to point out is the directional arrow on this relationship. Now, this, this again, if you did things right, this should point down to the data table from the lookup down to the data table. Uh, and generally, your relationships when you're starting out should look like this. Now, there are other patterns. There are many to many relationships, there are bi directional relationship, and we're going to link to a video which covers all the details of that. But when you're starting out, your relationships should typically look like this. Until you understand when you use your, those other types, you should not use them. Let's go ahead and connect our, our, our other tables using the keys. So I'm going to drag the sales territory key over here. And for the calendar table, I'm going to take the order date and connect that to the date column in the calendar table. Nice. Now that's done. Let's also give some love to our budget table. And we're going to do the same thing. I'm going to connect the product key to the product key in the product table. And I'm going to use the month budget data as a monthly level to connect to the calendar date. Just a quick note here on the calendar table. That is one of the most powerful tables in Power BI and almost, well, every data set should have it. Now, this one we're using a simpler version, but I, I am going to link to the ultimate calendar table, which is a lot more powerful and you can watch those videos next and learn all about that. Now that our relationships are in place, let's go and have some fun with our data. So for this, we're going to switch back to our reporting uh, panel over here. And we're not really trying to build a report. We're just simply trying to have some fun and just explore the data. Now here, if you have the visualization pane uh, not expanded, then make sure you expand that. And here you're going to find a chalk full of basic visualizations. Now you do have the option to add custom visualizations as well. We're going to cover that in a separate video, but there's a lot of uh, really cool graphics and visualization available to you. We're going to start with the one that's called the card element, which is right there. So you click on it and it places it on uh, your report page over here. So and and then now you can add fields to it. So again, here in under that now once I have the selected, I have these three panes here. Let's uh, go through them. So there's the fields, there's the format. And then I think the last one is analytics. So first one fields, the card one only takes one value. So I'm just going to drag and drop the sales amount field over here. Perfect. So we can see the sales amount. Uh, in fact, you know what? Card is not that much fun. So we're going to switch that to a table. So that's uh, right there. I'm going to click on that. And now it's a table. Now I notice that the sales amount isn't quite formatted correctly. I would rather have that be shown as dollars. Um, in fact, bef even before that, what I'm going to do is switch to the format pane, search for size, and just make that a tad bit bigger. So let's go with maybe 12 font. Perfect. So it's a little bit bigger. And again, I want to format it as dollars. So I'm going to go to the modeling tab and say, I want this to be a currency. And I'm going to change the decimal places to zero. All right. So that's taken care of. And yep. So you can see sales amount here. 
And, and, and again, this is the power of relationships. Now I can go to my calendar table and slice and dice it any which way I want. Let's start by slicing it by year. Now, sometimes Power BI does this, um, well, which would seem silly to you, but hey, it's just trying to help you the best it, it thinks it can. But sometimes it'll do something like where it's, uh, you can notice here that it's actually doing a sum of the calendar year, which of course is silly for us. But you can easily fix that by clicking on the drop down over here and just saying it, don't summarize. So instead of sum, you're going to say don't summarize. And now we see that we have a nice table of our sales amount. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy paste that table. So let's just go here, copy and paste. So I have a copy of that here because what I want to do is I want to, instead of sales amount, I want to show budget amount. So I'm going to hit X and remove that column and go to my budget table and find the budget amount from there. Cool. So I'm going to quickly reformat it as well as we had done the other field. Perfect. Now you can see that we only have budget for one year. So why don't we add a filter just for that year so we can dive in deeper in that year. So for this, I want you to expand the filter pane over here and you would notice two sections in here. One is filters to apply just to this page or filters on all pages. And eventually you are going to end up with uh, adding more report pages as and when you need to build uh, additional reports. But for now, we just have one page. So what we're going to do is we're going to drag our year over to this filters on this page. And then we'll change this to basic filtering. Um, you could do this in advanced filtering as well, but basic filtering and we'll select the year 2016. And now that we have that, the next thing I want to do is I just want to see it by month rather than year. So for that, let's go over to this table. I'm just trying to move them apart. Great. And I'm going to move in the month right between year and sales. So I'm going to drop that here, but watch what happens. So notice the sort order is a little weird and you can see the sort order is sorting by sales amount. We do want to sort it by month, but if you try to do that, notice how it's sorting alphabetically because that is the default sort order thing uh, for text columns at least. You can change that though. We don't want our months sorted alphabetically and you can do that by selecting the month column in, in, uh, from your field list and then go to the modeling tab and then select sort by column drop down and you can tell it to sort it by a different field and the field that we are going to use is the month number. That way January has the month number one so it becomes the top of the list and once you have made that selection you would notice that it's now sorted correctly. Let's do the same for our budget table and this time uh, once you have done the sort by column you don't have to do it again. Notice that it's already showing in the correct order. So you can see the power of relationships here where they essentially work like filter transmission wires. So just by connecting it with this table, now you're able to slice and dice sales by any of the customer attributes, any of the product attributes, any of the territory or any of the calendar attributes. Let's do one more table where we're going to take our sales amount. So let's do a new table and uh, let's add our sales amount over there. Perfect. Let's uh, make the font a little bit bigger. And this time I'm going to go to the territories table and grab the country and slice and dice it by that. I might as well collapse this filter pane. And again, I'm going to drag in country. Perfect. So you can see how we can slice and dice data any which way we want. Now, the cool part here is the notice here that we had the sales amount and budget amount and we could see them side by side, but you do not have to. In fact, I'm going to copy over this table, put it on the side over here. And once when you connect your data tables and lookup tables in this manner, you can put the, the numbers are sliced and diced them side by side. So right here in this table, I can also add the budget amount and you can see I can see them side by side in the very same table. The only rule to follow is this. You can only slice and dice using the connected tables. The sales table can be analyzed by customer, product, territory and calendar. Budget table can only be analyzed by product and calendar. And when you place elements from multiple tables together, you can only slice and dice using the common lookup tables. Follow those rules and the world is your oyster. Let's step into the magical realm of DAX. DAX stands for Data Analytics Expressions. 
and it's essentially Power BI's formula language, and it is one of the most incredibly powerful features in Power BI. So we're going to start slow though, and I've cleaned up the other tables. We're going to focus on sales amount here. Now, what you may not realize is you've already created a DAX formula or a DAX measure. Now, when you drag and drop a column over uh, over from your field list to a display or to a visual area, and it selects one of these options, what it has done is it has created an implicit measure for you. So the measure has been created for you. You can't see it, but it's it's there for you. And of course, you saw the options there where you can change the measure as well to uh, some of these options. Now, my advice to you would be to never use implicit measures. Never drag and drop a column over to that. So let me show you the other option, which is explicit measure. And from now on, I'm just going to say measures. And by that, I would mean explicit measure. So uh, let's go ahead and create that. So for that, you're going to go to the modeling tab. And over here, you're going to click on new measure. So let's just do that. And here, it gives me this formula bar. So I'm going to zoom into that. And I'm going to define my measure sales. And it's going to be the sum of sales amount. And you notice how it auto completes. In fact, I don't have to start with the word sales. I can say amount and it would find the options for that. So it's pretty cool, pretty nifty, makes uh, typing formulas really easier. And you can go up arrow, down arrow to select through the list and tab to auto complete. So you can see this is one reason why I fell in love with Power BI and because starting out, you, you realize that it's quite familiar. I mean, I was familiar with these functions, sum, min, max, average, in Excel, and here I could use them in Power BI. Now, of course, what I didn't know then was how incredibly deep and powerful it is. So that's a good thing to know. You know that there are lots of capabilities in there. But for our first step, you can see how easy it is. And I'm going to hit Enter and let it calculate. I'm also going to format it as currency. All right, so I changed the format to a currency as we had done for our sales amount column. And now let's go back. And now I'm going to drag this sales to our table over here and watch what happens. Oh, my G. <laughs> All right, well, actually, nothing spectacular happened. In fact, it might have been let down for you. It's like, well, well, what's the big deal? I mean, this is, you know, it's just giving you the same number. But again, one of those is implicit measure where we dragged in a column. So again, it is still a measure. Power BI under the hood still defined a measure for you, an implicit measure. And the other one is we defined it. Now, we're not going to go, we're not going to have time in this tutorial to dive into the details, but there are three key reasons why explicit measures are so much more powerful and recommended. They are control, reuse, and impact on connected reports. So we're going to link to a video that goes into more detail, but going forward, we'll focus on defining our measures ourselves. When we were creating our measure, you might have noticed the button next to it to define a different kind of calculation, not a new measure, but a new column. But before we get into that, we're going to save the file and look at the file size. Now, this might seem silly, but believe me, we're going to check the file size again, and it's going to reveal something really fundamental about Power BI. So now we're back here, and let's go on our merry way to create our first calculated column. So for this, I'm going to stay in my sales table. So again, I switched to data view and selected my sales table over here. And here, if you notice that we have the sales amount and tax amount in separate columns. Now, what if we wanted to add these two to essentially get a total of these two? So for that, we are going to cl uh, uh, click on new column, and it's going to give us a formula bar as before. So now I have this formula bar, but it starts with the column name. I don't want my column to be called column. So let's change that, and we're going to call it total sales amount. And for this one, we're just going to add these two quantities up, just kind of how you might do it in Excel. So I'm going to say, give me the sales amount plus the tax amount. Great. And actually, it is the best practice when you're referencing columns to prefix it with the table name. So we're going to follow that. 
and I'm going to hit enter and watch what happens over here. Let me quickly reformat this just so they look a little bit prettier and we'll come back and continue. So I've reformatted them and I've also scrolled down just so we look at some interesting data. And here you can see it is doing what it's supposed to is just adding these two numbers up and giving us the sum. But now let's do the acid test of saving the file and checking the file size again. All right, so that is our new file size with the calculated column that we added. Could we define the same calculation instead of as a column as a measure? Well, let's try it out. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come in here and copy this formula and this time we're gonna click the new measure button right there. So I'm gonna click that and again, it gives me that formula bar but this time it wants me to define a measure. Great, I'm gonna paste the same one and I don't wanna give them the sale same name so I'm just gonna say total sales and let's see if it works. Now already you can see that there are signs of trouble. Those red squiggly lines are telling you something is off. But if I hit enter, I get back this error. Now what's going on? I mean clearly that formula was good. It was working here. Why would it not work in a measure? Well my friends, so this is one of the fundamental one of the fundamental differences between measures and calculated column, which is the idea of a row context. Now I'll admit when I heard these terms row context and there's another one you would encounter filter context they scared the heck out of me. And sometimes things won't work and like, oh my gosh, I gotta, I gotta try to figure out what's going on with the row context or the filter context. Well, it turns out that they're fundamentally simple concepts. So row context is simply the knowledge of the current row. So when you're in a calculated column and as Power BI is going through these uh, values and just trying to calculate them one by one, it obviously, uh, let's try that again it obviously knows the row it's on and that gives it the row context. Now what that means is when you reference a column directly as we are over here, we're just saying uh, directly to the column, right? And this is also called a naked column reference where we are uh, referencing it directly. Now this works because it has the row context in a calculated column. But when you go to a measure, notice that the measure you know, it didn't show up as a column over here because the measure is not part, really part of the table. So here, there is no row context. In measure, there's no built-in row context. Now you can create it, but we'll save that for a later video. So since it does not have the idea of a row context or a idea of a current row, when you reference a column directly, it's saying which value. I mean, you're, you're asking me to get sales amount, but I have lots and lots of them. Which one do you want? Again, because it's lacking the knowledge of a current row. Now the way to fix that is to wrap these naked column references and put some clothes on them. And you do that by uh, the wrapper we're gonna use are aggregation measures, aggregation functions. And one of them is sum, and that's of course what we're looking to do. So we're gonna wrap this in a sum, and uh, I'm not sure why the squiggly line is still there, and I'm gonna wrap this in a sum and hit enter and see what it does. Now perfect, so it calculated, now again, you don't see it here because again, measures are not stored as part of the table. That is another big difference between measures and calculated column. So to see that really uh, have it sink in, we're gonna save this file again now after having defined a measure and see what the file size is. All right, so that is our new file size. And if you notice that there was only a very minuscule change, and that is again, one of the key differences between measures and calculated columns. Calculated columns, every single number here that you calculated in this column is being stored back to the file. So every new calculated column that you add to your model will increase your file size. Whereas measures, the only really thing that it's storing is the measure definition, and it's not stored back into the file. Instead, measures are always calculated dynamically. We're gonna link to a separate video which goes into more detail about the differences between measures and calculated columns. But let's go back to this view and start exploring the new uh, calculated column and measure that we have created. So I'm gonna remove the sales amount and sales and instead bring in my total sales amount column and my total sales measure. You can see that the end result looks deceptively similar. Right, it's giving you the same numbers, 
But if you think about the underlying approach, if you keep adding calculated columns, and I know for Excel users, this, this feels easier, this feels more tempting, but understand that you're gonna add bloat to your model. Every single column you add, it increases its file size, and that also means that it increases its memory footprint when it's loaded in the model, and that's gonna that could slow the whole model down. So instead of, imagine if you write 10 or 50 or 100 calculations, there's a huge difference if you use calculated columns versus measures. So measures is the way to go. It's more compact, more efficient, and always dynamic. And again, click on the linked video in the description to find out more about the differences between measures and calculated columns. Hey, if you're still with me through this part of the video, I would really request that you subscribe and hit the like button to show your support for this video and our channel. Now that we have all fallen in love with measures, let's go ahead and define some more. So I'm gonna remove these from over here and I'm gonna bring in my sales measure and also bring in my budget measure. Oops, actually, I remember we had never defined a budget measure. So we're gonna define it pretty similar to how we have a sales measure. So I'm just gonna to go to the budget table, click anywhere in there, click new measure and, and just type it out. All right, we have that measure defined. We'll put that on here. And now you can see that we can visually compare and we can see, hey, when sales was higher. But of course, we don't need to. We can define what I call a hybrid measure, which goes across sales budget. And defining that is as easy as this. So I'm just gonna say new measure. And really what I'm looking for is variance, that how, how what was the difference between sales and budget? So let's go ahead and define that. All right, now let's add that on there. And we can see how easy that was. Just A minus B and that's it. Now let's go ahead and define a variance percentage as well. Now here I could define it using the divide operator. So I can say variance divided by budget. But this, when you use the division operator, that always carries a risk of division by zero, just in case budget is zero in some scenario. So the way out is use the divide function and you can see it says right there, it's a safe divide function with ability to handle divide by zero cases. So why not, you know, let's stay safe. And here you need to specify the numerator and denominator uh, as its two parameters. The last one is an optional parameter and you can leave that. That's just what to return when, uh, when there is division by zero and by default it returns blank, which is good enough for us. So, uh, and of course let's format it and let's add it to our table. Now I just want, I want you to stop and acknowledge and pat yourself on the back, my friend, for what you have achieved here. So what we have done is not only defined measures across two different data tables and being able to slice and dice them together, but also define hybrid measures which are effectively operating over both data tables. Now doing something like this in the old world, in the, in the BP era, before Power BI, would have been really nasty and ugly. And in fact, I had, you know, I was, I would often create two separate pivot tables and have some calculation on the side of the pivot table. I call them side table deductions. Uh, I would let you come up with an acronym for that. And yeah, these were extremely fragile and prone to breaking and they were not robust at all. And what you get here in Power BI is what I call the define once use everywhere magic of measures. So once you have defined this in variance or variance percentage, you can take any any of these parameters and slice and dice it any which way you want. So I can say, show this to me by category or uh, subcategory, and all of that just works. Let's uh, see it in its table so we can take a better look. There we go, and that's just scratching the surface, but the idea is this, that this approach applies to all data tables. So I know I'm just showing here sales and budget, but doesn't matter what your data set is. It could be headcount, head count, shipping, or invoice, or inventory, doesn't matter. Once you pull it into Power BI and arrange it and model it in a structure like the way I showed you with the data and lookup tables and connected with the power of relationships and then you define measures and automatically they have the magic of define ones used everywhere. You can define hybrid measures across any of the data tables that you bring in and slice and dice them any which way you want using your lookup tables. Our next goal is to go from this blank slate to this 
beautiful and interactive Power BI report. But you may be wondering that we spent so much time focusing on the query editor, the kitchen of Power BI, cleaning, shaping, transforming data, and we spent so much time talking about relationships and DAX. And only now, so late into the video, are we finally talking about visualizations. Isn't Power BI about visualizations? Well, my friends, that's where a lot of people go wrong, and, and, and you know that's not the path to becoming an expert in Power BI. You have to realize that the strength and power of Power BI lies under the hood, and it's in these two engines, the query editor and the model. And so, it, it, you know, remember the 80-20 rule, 80% 80 of your focus and effort as a Power BI author, Power BI model developer should be on these two things. And if you do these right, then creating visualizations is easy as you're gonna see just now. So again, this is the end report that we're trying to create, so let's get started. You've already seen that in the visualization pane is chock full of pretty amazing visualizations that you can drag and drop or place on your blank slate here, but there are also options here to add a text box image and shape. So I'm gonna start there. So I'm just gonna add a text box and give it a label. And next I'm gonna click on the image button here and bring in our AdventureWorks company logo. The next elements I'm gonna add are these card elements at the top. So let's go ahead and place the card element here. I'm just gonna click on that and that places it somewhere randomly on the page. And first thing I'm gonna do is grab my sales measure that is right there and I'm gonna drag and drop it onto there. I'm gonna copy this a few times, paste, paste, paste. And I have four of those and I'm gonna make it the sales budget variance and variance percentage. So this one becomes a budget and actually you, you can't drag and drop it on there, but if you drag and drop it onto the fields, you can replace that. So that becomes the budget. Great, the next one is the variance and I'm just gonna move that here. And this one is the variance percentage. The display units you would notice is automatic right now. If you like, you can change that to none or just show that in millions, that's up to you. We're gonna change it to none just to see the actual value right there. Next, we're gonna place a shape element just to make sure that this really pops out our high level data. So we're gonna size it to change the line. Uh, we're gonna change the weight to, uh, to be really small. Okay, so the line is gone. And next, I'm gonna change the fill color. So for that, I'm gonna go in here, fill color, and I'm gonna make it really light. So I'm gonna increase the transparency as well, about 60%. And that looks nice. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move this thing to the back and and then I can move it behind uh, these visuals that I have here. Let's go ahead and place the other elements on our report. Now folks, I might go a little bit fast here. The point that I wanted to convey was that building reports is part art Art science. So in this part, it's not really important if you follow what I'm doing click by click and visual by visual and, and take full liberty to create and craft a report to your liking. Let's start with a bar chart and yeah, we're gonna place it right there. And here I'm gonna add both the sales and the budget and then provide the axis as the product category and subcategory. Now notice what happens when I add the category there, you see the breakdown, but when I add the subcategory, you don't really see a change. But what this allows you to do is it allows it drill down. So in here you have all these buttons you can use, or what I like to do is I just try to use my mouse when I'm on my desktop where I can just say drill down, and I can drill down to the, the specific categories and bikes, and then I can drill up and so forth. Now, one thing I'm gonna change here is the sort order, and I'm gonna make it alphabetical. So I'm gonna change the sort by to say category, and, and here I'm gonna say sort ascending. Perfect, I'm gonna copy this graph, and instead of sales and budget, I'm gonna bring in my variance. And what I would like to do here is to show some coloring on here. So for that, I'm gonna go to the format pane, data colors, and right now at least, uh, in the current functionality, what you do is you click on the ellipses here and choose conditional formatting. 
that brings up this dialog box and color scale is exactly what we want although you can see that there are other options available as well but the way we want to color it is actually based on the variance value so we're going to go ahead and select that and lowest value and the highest value and that looks good and I'm going to hit OK and here now you can see that if we if we drill into let's say accessories you can see the detail where the worst value is, is like a deep shade of red and it's green as it gets better let's build our next graph and I'm going to copy paste this here and change this to a line chart and instead of category and subcategory I'm going to bring in my month and from my lookup table, the calendar table. I'll copy paste that again, change this one to a column chart. And instead of budget and sales, I want to show variance here, similar to the graph above. And I'm going to add color to it the same way I had done for it for the graph at the top. The last two items are, we're going to add are this detail, a little bit of detail showing our top products and top customers. So let's add a table element over here and I'm going to grab the product name from the product lookup table. Product name, great. And I'm going to grab the sales from this table. So I'm going to do three things here. First, let's change the size to be a little bit larger and also turn the totals off because we don't really need the total we're already showing the total over here so we're gonna, I, I just search for total and turn that off and the last thing that I'm gonna do is I don't want to see a scroll bar here I really want to see only the top products now I can sort it descending my sales but notice how there's still a scroll bar so for that what I'm going to do is expand the filter pane and I notice here that when a visual is selected you have additional options once a visual is selected you can specify additional filters just for this visuals and that's what I'm going to do so I'm going to say product name instead of basic filtering I want to use the top n filtering and in this case I want to have the top 10 items but it also asks you with using what top 10 based on what and for that I'm going to add back in the sales measure that I'm going to I'm showing here and apply filter and notice now it's just showing me the top 10 values now we're going to recreate this using uh, customers so now instead of top products we're going to show top customers that's it our report is ready and this is fully interactive so you can click on on something and see what was going on specifically details in that month you can drag thing here and still select to see that and of course we saw the drill down earlier where you can drill down into specific category and select a specific subcategory if you needed to and everything in that report is going to filter down just to that selection we have come so far we've gone through all these steps and are now ready for the next phase which we would start by publishing a report Publishing your report could not be easier. The publish button is right bang in the middle on here and all you have to do is click publish. Now the first time you do this you might need to create a Power BI, uh, Power BI account but it's free and it's really easy. Now here instead of my workspace which you should be choosing I'm just going to use a different workspace. Now this is a pro feature which requires a paid license and I'm going to link to a video which talks to you more about the Power BI licensing but again if you select my workspace which you should then that does not require a paid license and that is that you can use with creating a free profile on PowerBI.com. So click select and there goes off sending your model to the cloud and publishing it to powerbi.com that's done so what we have done is we have taken the model that we authored with so much with so much love and now we have put it up in the cloud and that can be used by hundreds of users let me show you how here we are in I'm using a scratch workspace but again for you it would be just your my workspace so go to that and what you would see in here are these tabs now we're going to start on the data set tab right there and this is where you should see the model that you just published now data set in my mind is basically your data model now what you can do here is if you scoot over to the reports tab over here you're going to see there is a report as well now if you open this report this should look familiar this is what we've been building on 
all along. So your report has been is there as well. But what this does is this concept of separates the model from the reports. So if you go back to our main workspace, uh, the report just becomes one report that is connected to the data set. You can go back to the data set and click on this icon right here to create as many Power BI reports as you want. So again, what this gives you is that this new blank canvas and I can just say, give me sales by month and there you go. I've created a new report and this is the strength of the Power BI platform. You have this one data source, a single source of truth, and now you can create multiple, lots and lots of Power BI report all connected back to that single model, to that single source of truth. You can also set up automated refreshes for your data set, and that I'll let you explore by going to the data set tab. And again, once that single source is refreshed, all the connected reports will automatically be refreshed. And as you can see by the icons here, you can also create Excel reports that are connected back to the model and all you have to do is click on this and say analyze in Excel and that will let you create an, uh, an Excel report which is, which is connected back to your single model. Power BI has yet another amazing feature which we haven't even explored yet and that is dashboards. Now you have seen a report and report is something that you build in the Power BI desktop and right now we just have a single page here but you can create a report with multiple pages and that's what identifies a PowerBI.com report. You can have multiple pages on here and it gives you this rich detailed and interactive look, look where you can slice and dice and click and explore explore your data. The idea with Power BI dashboards is to give you a high level view, a snapshot picture, which you can easily take in, easily look at it on your mobile phone using the native Power BI app. And hey, if something interests you, then you can just tap it and go into the detail by diving into the report view. So dashboard is this high level view. Now, how do you go about creating a dashboard? Well, you go to your report on PowerBI.com, and if you hover over elements, you would notice that it, it, it comes up with this thumbtack icon and in fact if you hover over that it's going to say pin visual now if you click that so we're going to start with that element it's going to say pin to the dashboard and right now we do not have a, an existing dashboard so that one is grayed out so we're just going to create a new dashboard give it a name and just pin the element there now if I were to scoot over to the dashboard right now it doesn't look very interesting but let's go back to a report and, and clip in a few more elements. I'm just gonna select the visuals that I tend to like and, and hover over them and click on that pin visual button. And this time I can just select that existing dashboard and select pin. Let's do that for a few more elements. Hey, I found pinning these elements a little bit tricky. My best advice is to click to select that element and then it should be easier to, uh, and to, to click the pin visual button. Go ahead and pin the highlighted visuals shown here to your Power BI dashboard. All right, let's go to our dashboard and see what it looks like now. Now we have these different elements, but it doesn't look very pretty. It doesn't look very well laid out, but this is so easy to organize. Now these individual ones are called tiles and they snap to a specific grid. And if I make it small enough, it's gonna to snap to a specific size. And now what that snapping does is it makes it really easy for Power BI to lay it out in a very beautiful fashion on mobile devices. So let's go ahead and just organize our tiles a little bit better. Here we go. Not not a bad looking dashboard. Eh? Again, again, uh, the idea of the dashboard is to give you this high level view and if you see something that's interesting, you can just click to dive into the report experience where you have full detail, rich interactivity where you can slice and dice the data and see what's going on. Let's go back to our dashboard and I'll show you the, the key feature, the ability to share reports. And you do that by clicking uh, share dashboards. And you do that by clicking on the share button. And here you can just type in any email address that you want to share the dashboard with. Now this does require pro licensing, a paid license. You can sign up for a short trial, but I'll link to the video covering Power BI licensing in detail. Your next steps from here will decide your fate, my friend. We have been on an epic journey together to build the model and understand the Power BI framework. But real learning comes from doing. 
So number one, watch the video again and make sure to follow along with the download files. Use the table of contents in description if you need to. Number two, watch the linked videos to go deeper. And number three, join me live for Talk Power BI Fridays. When you're ready, join our paid training program, the Learn Power BI family, to continue your journey. Until next time, power on, my friend. Thank you.